the fact that Jamaica supplies the United States with the majority of its mineral source of aluminum, bauxite. Michael Manley is prime minister, elected in 1972 and re-elected this year by an overwhelming majority. This charismatic statesman has become a world figure. Among third world nations, he is highly respected, principally because of the system of government that he has prescribed for Jamaica, called democratic socialism, as well as for his positions on third world issues. For example, he was a keynote speaker at this year's United Nations Conference in Maputo, Mozambique, a conference focused on the Southern African crisis. On October 28th, while he was in New York, Mr. Manley agreed to an exclusive interview with Like It Is. We began with the subject of Jamaica's new form of government, democratic socialism, a concept and practice that has caused great controversy and some dissension. When we, we came to power, I felt I've always belonged to that camp of people that believes that a society succeeds best where it most clearly articulates purposes. And that this is really the key to the political significance of philosophies of this kind. And that we really hadn't looked for a long time at socialism, which, you know, is a wide concept, as indeed is capitalism, yes. a wide <laughs> concept. Yes. Um, and so we felt that the time had come to take this all out, look at it again, get the party cadres, all the groups and sections of the party to think about it, debate it, look at what had happened to the world since 1940, look at what had happened to the world since 1945. And so we went through a tremendous exercise that went on for months all over Jamaica. And eventually drafts were prepared of ways of expounding our contemporary interpretation. We looked at, studied, debated, and eventually well, a, 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 a document known as Democratic Socialism, the Jamaica model, evolved mm -hmm. by intensive internal democratic debate. And that really is the philosophy to which you refer. And um, as I said, those are the forces that led to it, partly because it has always been so, and partly because we felt it was necessary. There, was, there were certain social pressures at that time at all times. There are tremendous social pressures in, in, in Jamaica. Jamaica, like almost all countries that had a long colonial experience, um, is a product of that experience and reflected at the time of independence sharp class divisions, um, a very small and highly privileged elite the elite who were really the beneficiaries of colonialism and of the, the purest process of economic exploitation. Uh, tremendous poverty, dangerous gaps between the haves and the have-nots. All of those are colonial legacies and all of those are charged with social tension, the inevitability of social tension. And a lot of what we have tried to do as, as a government is really addressing those problems by government action, but attempting not to address them in a piecemeal haphazard way, but address them in a systematic way, in an organized way, and in a way that is pointed by having a philosophy. Mm. Now, you are uh, a seasoned man of the world, and surely it must have occurred to you when you formulated this philosophy of government that it may have frightened people to hear this term socialism, whatever its appendage, had you, had you figured to allow for the reaction that you, that might have come out of saying socialism, that many people might have jumped back and said, ah, communism, had, had you yes, anticipated no, we, that? We, we, we knew that there were risks that, that, that would attach to this. You know, anything that you do in life mm -hmm. has risks. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the thing about life is whether the risks are worth your objectives. And uh, the real truth, you know, is that there is a... I'm always a little amused by the suggestion that the thing, for instance, that really frightened people was socialism. That's not what frightened people. What frightened people in Jamaica was that there was a group who had had a great life for a long time. They'd been very privileged. And they'd found ways for years never to pay their taxes, to make no contribution to the development of a just society. And before we 
declared the democratic socialism. We had begun to address the problem of privilege, the gap between the rich and the poor. We had started to introduce wealth taxes to get at people who had very skillfully avoided income taxes for many years. And we had begun land reform, redistribution of land, and there were all the objective signs of the first attempt to build an egalitarian society, which begins with the dismantling of the citadels of privilege. And, uh, for instance, the migration from Jamaica predated the Declaration of Democratic Socialism. But naturally, once democratic socialism was declared, it provided a convenient label which people could attach to fears that they had for other reasons. Was it as heavy as afterward? Um, no, but I don't think democratic socialism is really what precipitated any oh. acceleration of migration. What did cause a very regrettable, we've never wanted people to migrate, we've always asked people to stay, but we've said very firmly, we're not going to compromise the policies because Jamaica has to be changed. You don't change anything without a certain amount of difficulty and a certain amount of upset. This is inevitable. And uh, what really would have caused uh, accelerations in migration is when there were accelerations in the measures, the objective measures that were necessary to bring about change. When land reform became more vigorous and more dynamic, people got more upset, certain kinds of landowners got more upset, and so on and so forth. Though, in fact, a lot of it's very interesting, you know, because a lot of it was an interpretation of objective events. If you really look at the things that we have done, they have not been draconian. The society is still completely free. The press is free. The elections are free. The democracy is free. The rule of law is entrenched. You know, all of those institutions are firmly in place. And as I said, the actual things that have been done have not been that harsh. But I think that what really happened in Jamaica was a combination of two things. One, the inevitable insecure reaction to change. And this you just have to accept. But it also was taking place in a context of the most wrenching economic circumstances that you can imagine. You cannot understand that problem in Jamaica outside of the context of what world inflation did us and what the world recession did us, where we were caught in what begun with wheat prices that multiplied by five in a society that's very dependent on grains for its basic diet. And wheat, corn, soya beans didn't go up 50%, 400%, 500%. We were just overwhelmed with inflation in an economy very dependent on trade. Then came the oil prices in a country that depends to the tune of 97% on oil for its energy. And suddenly the oil bill multiplied by four, knocked the whole balance of payments sideways. Many manufacturers who had begun, had launched firms in recent years, did not have a very strong economic base as yet, suddenly found themselves in a situation where all their suppliers of raw materials were threatening to cancel raw, raw material supplies if they wouldn't, were not allowed to break the supply contracts oh. and double or treble the price. So that a tremendous economic insecurity resulted from all of this. So that here we were embarked on what we conceived as the necessity for serious change. When the process of change, already an upsetting phenomenon by itself, was set in the context of this tremendous world economic convulsion, now, that's an awful lot of stuff to handle at one time. And a lot of people got frightened. What about the question of race in Jamaica? Now, there is a national slogan, out of many, one. Or out of one, many. Out of many, one. Out of many, one. Yes. Sorry. Now, was racism a problem in Jamaica, or was it just along the lines that you've described, a social problem, an economic problem? Well, let's put it this way. At Plus. root it is an economic problem. At root, it is a class problem, a class problem that has flowed from a certain type of economic history based in slavery, colonialism, and a kind of capitalist system in a colonial environment. And inevitably, as is true of all post-slave societies, there has been the correlation between economic status 
and therefore class status and skin color in the classic pattern of, you know, the black masses who were the slaves and then became farmers and workers. The brown middle classes who were 